We are now recording. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Sadie, the director of Timespan. And for those who don't know, we're a cultural institution in the village of Helmsdale, which is in the very northeast of the Scottish Highlands. Um, so thank you all for joining us um, to the faceless crowd, which is a bit weird um, speaking like this. Um, so tonight is the launch of Fab Club, which is our film and book club. And we're doing this in collaboration with our pals at Life Arts Centre, who are further north than us in Cape Nets. Um, and this season, we're going to be focusing on international anti-imperialism and resistance against white supremacy. And of course, it's in no small part um, due to the recent uprisings in um, anti-racist public consciousness and the movements in the street which were triggered by the murder of George Floyd in the States. Um, I don't know if there's a need for this defence, but um, there's a lot of tokenism and um, empty gestures and um, managerial diversification in the arts industry. And certainly for us at Timespan, it's crucial that we continually are examining you know, our organisational structure as well as their programme um, in this ongoing pr process of demodernising the cultural institution. Um, and an anti-colonial politics runs through the veins of everything that we're trying to do. And this is not a, you know, a so-called radical approach or fringe politics, it's common sense and it's the truth of Britain, which was built on the exploitation of peoples and the extraction of resources from the so-called um, developing world. And this, this history, it's not consigned to history. So racism is very, very real in Britain today. Um, and it's, it's in the prison populations in the disproportionate incarceration rate of black men. Um, it's in our hellish immigration detention centres. It's the criminalization of drill artists, our foreign policy, the very lucrative arms industry. And yes, it's police violence and deaths in custody and um, no prosecutions and so on and so on and so on. Um, so when Charlotte, who is co-director of LIFE, and I were discussing this, of course, what came up that the Highlands is a very, very, very white place. And we both agreed that it was important to do this here because of that. Um, and this fight sort of has to come from every corner, including this wee Highland village that I'm in today. Um, and as a wise friend once told me um, that you have to fight with the tools of the trades that you have, whatever they are. Um, and our trade is culture. And at this point, we need nothing short of a sort of total trans cultural transformation. Um, to resist and to fight against the violence, the right-wing politics, which are the heart of British society. Um, so with FAB, the Film and Book Club, we're going back to basics. So we're going to be reading foundational texts from the Black Canon. Um, and we're starting this next week um, with The Heart of the Race. And Stella Dadsey, who's one of the authors, is going to be leading this book club. Um, and it's going to be monthly. So we're going to have a film and a book um, every month. So shout me if you'd like to join. Um, so that reference to my wise friend was, of course, Ken Farrell. Um, hi, Ken. Hi. I don't remember saying that. Yeah, you did in, in Coventry, back in Coventry. Um, it was when I was warning about that culture doesn't, we had no purchase or agency within the real world. Yeah to make it ma make it mean something so t sorry let me introduce you ken um yeah so ken introduced me to ufsc which is the united friends and family campaign which is a network of families um who've been affected by deaths deaths in uk police custody um and i don't think it's unfair to say but it's majority led by incredible women who are relentless in their fight for justice. Um, so Ken's also the founding director of Migrant Media, which is a collective um, of filmmakers who produce experimental documentaries um, that are very, very powerful testament and records of those in the front line of grassroots struggle. Um, and they're 
I'd say the documentaries are in the tradition of so like black audio film collectors film essays and um it's it, it, they're about using films as a tool for the struggle. Um, so I've seen Injustice a few times in its power and it's the rage that it invokes sort of maintains each time. Um, so Ken is just going to introduce the film and then after the, the screening, so we're going to watch it all together. And if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the chat function. And then once the screening is over, Ken is going to be joined by Khadija George, who's the cousin of Sheku Bayo, who died in police, Scottish police custody in 2015, um, to, tell about, to tell us about that case and the family's fight for justice. So thank you, Ken. Um, and over to you. Okay. Um, okay, I'll be brief. Um, I think everyone can hear me. Um, I'm just going to break the system now and just ask everybody just to put their cameras on because I'm not going to talk to a list of names. Anyone that wants to put their camera on, please go ahead. Okay. Hi. Hi, 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 hi. Humans. Hello. <laughs> Look, the system isn't breaking down. Um, just, yeah, you'll have to put them off when the film is on, I think, because there'll be problems in streaming. So good evening to you all, um, wherever you are. Uh, I'm really not going to say very much because I think the film speaks for itself. Um, I, I would just say that um, we released the film in 2001 um, and since then it's been um, all over the world really on television, in cinemas, uh, in political meetings, in community meetings. It's been seen by revolutionaries and by judges as well. And it touches everybody um, because I think of the power of the people in the film, of the women in the film. Um, 19 years ago, Channel 4 refused to show the film. And I think what I would say, how I feel now is that if they had shown the film uh, 19 years ago, some of the people who have died since then wouldn't have died. Because any police officer seeing this film would have thought twice about using excessive violence. Um, and that's quite an accusation I make against Channel 4. Uh, but that's the reality of, of, the, of the country we're living in. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's old, it's been called a classic. I don't feel old, I don't feel classic, but apparently that's what I am. Um, so 20 years later, it'll be interesting to see what you think of it. Some of you may have seen it already. Uh, and of course you've seen everything that's happening now. Um, I'm heavily involved with BLM and with uh, other things that are going on. Um, and I'll be able to give you some background in terms of where the families, or Khadija will speak for, for herself, but where the other families feel the whole situation is going at the moment um, uh, and some of, some of the uh, things that you can do um, to get involved in the struggle if you're not involved already. So, um, yeah, uh, I'll see you in, I guess, 98 minutes. Okay, so can everyone just turn your videos off on mute? Ian, can you check if there's anyone else in the waiting room? And just let people in as the film is playing? Okay. Uh, there's nobody currently waiting and I will continue to let people in as they arrive. Thank you. And can you go full screen for when the film plays? Yes, yeah, so if, when, when we, uh, in a minute, everybody should turn off, everybody including you should turn off your cameras and um, I will start the video playing and then everybody should see the uh, video full screen. Thanks Ian, right I'm going mute. Ian are we ready to go? Uh, yes I've uh, unpaused the recording um, and I will just start the streaming to Hello. Hi. Ian, is Khadija with us? Uh, yes. Khadija, please could you unmute your mic and come on video? Yep. Yeah. Sadie, are you muted? No, can you not hear me? Hello. Hi, Khadija. Hello, hi Ken. 
I couldn't watch the ending of that. I had to switch off. No. I think everybody can put their cameras on now. Yeah, I, I haven't watched it since um, 2001. Okay. Did you not watch it at the conference? No, I've never watched it oh, God. for the past 19 years. I've always had to go out and wait for 98 minutes. I'm not surprised. I thought they were bringing me in right at the end and then they brought me in and I'm like, oh God. <laughs> mm. oh, that's a bit too much. Um, Ian, can we start recording, please? In case uh, yes, we are currently recording and... Um... Okay, so everyone, for those who joined us um, after the screening, so we'll just watch Michael Media's film, Injustice, and we're joined um, by the director, Ken Farrell, and Khadija George, who's the public deputy who um, died in police custody in, in 2015. Um, Khadija, thank you. So much for your generosity um, and joining us. Um, and just to say, watching that film again is so fucking horrible. These scenes of deep, deep grief and rage, and the chance of no justice, no peace, and the media and police tactics of criminalising the victims have been repeated again and again since. Um, and just how dear mourn us still being forced to be in the front line because there's been no joy justice for them. So Ken, it's important, thank you. And oh, looking forward to a bit of a strange term, but um, your your new film is needed as well. Um, so I thought, so could you tell, please, could you tell us about Shaky? Um, who he was before his death in custody? Well, I know Shaku um, Bayer was uh, a young man, 31, family man. He had two children, two children, two little boys, and one was, was just three months old when he died. So he barely spent any time with him, and he's never going to know his dad. Hopefully, he will know exactly the truth of what happened to his dad. Um, he was the youngest brother of, of the family. I'm, I'm a cousin. He was the youngest brother of the family. He had three older sisters. So, of course, he's like their little brother, <laughs> you know. Um, and, you know, he, and he was living in Scotland because his sister felt it was going to be safer for a young black man rather than living in London, lo and behold. It wasn't, you know, he adored his nieces as well, these two nieces that he had in Scotland. And even the day before, he'd just been at the birthday party for the youngest one, you know? So, it, and so, so then for his mum to get a call the next day, his mum, Caddy Johnson, to have police come in the next day after the birthday party, after they'd just seen him, to say, well, he's no longer with you. It's like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about, you know? And then when I got the call, that I think it must have been either later that day or the next day. And I'm like going, but what are you talking about? It, it just, just, just it was just so unreal. It was so unreal. And it still seems unreal. So even though you say, you know, there's no chance of justice, we all believe there must be some chance of justice and that's what keeps us going. There must be some chance of it because that's what keeps you going. You've got to keep fighting for it. One of us has to get it. And once one of us get it, and hopefully the other ones will then just start coming through. It's sad that you have to look at what happens at a tragic situation in America to fight for our own justice for people mm -hmm. here. That's what's happening continuously. You keep yeah. getting all of these comments like from different companies and different organizations about how terrible it is and how things you know, are, are going to be changed in terms of systemic racism, but they only talk about victims in America trying to not to think or even believe it happens here. Yeah. yeah, there's always this sense of British exceptionalism when it comes to police violence. Yes. Um, it's always, it, and it's the same sort of thing where you're, you're, you're saying it's only happening in America and in Scotland. 
um, like what you were saying about Sheku, this sense of the because Scotland's whitewashed its colonial history and there's such a sense that it's safer here um, for black and brown people and it, uh, clearly it's absolutely not. No, absolutely not, you know, and then like I suppose in Scotland they would think maybe it only happens in England, it doesn't, but it is the first case to be, I mean it's going to be investigated um, as, a, as a public inquiry into into uh, state violence, into, into um, uh, a death in custody and police and um, but then again that's because as well we fought for it from the beginning yeah um, it probably happened to somebody else and so a lot of cases never even get known about <laughs> things never even get known about but we wanted to make sure that this was and can you tell us about the evidence that the family have gathered sorry can you tell us about the evidence that the family have gathered? Well, there is quite a lot of evidence um, in terms of, even though the CCTV, you can't actually always see faces. I haven't actually necessarily seen the CCTV, but apparently the CCTV, you can't see faces, but you can see very clearly what happened. So then the statements that the police were coming out with 32 days later, well, a lot of them were refuted. A lot of what they said did not actually happen. So we are, so the, so the evidence is continuing to be covered. The pub, there's going to be a public inquiry has been announced, but it will happen in May. They were putting the team together, even during all the lockdown and the virus, we thought, the lockdown and the virus, we thought that things would be slowed down, but they put the team together. So we just wanted, to, waiting to find out, to know when the public inquiry is going to start. And can you tell us what a public inquiry is and what outcomes are possible? And does that equate to justice? Um, well, I'm not a legal person, I don't know, but we do know that basically that the police, none of the police are likely to be um, charged with this. Uh, number one, two of the people involved, especially one of them, who was one of the ones who sat on him, um, has retired already. So once, um, and I'm not sure what the actual stage of that is, but he's no longer with the police force. So we, that we do know that none of the police are actually going to be charged. What we're trying to find out is what exactly happened and to make sure that with that knowledge, that things are going to change so that it doesn't happen to anybody else. And to see if racism, which if racism was a factor in this case. So there are certain questions they were hoping are going to be answered, but nobody's going to be charged for his killing. Nobody's going, to be, nobody's going to be accountable for his death. No, and I guess this is a question for both you and Ken. So the legal system is woefully insufficient. Inadequate. Totally. Yeah. Uh, um, at providing justice for families. Um, can you tell us about the sort of legal processes that families have to endure and what demands the families are making on the law? Isn't that covered by the film already? I think most people kind of understand the failure of the inquest system, don't they? You've just watched 98 minutes of three families going through it, so it might be better to get people to ask questions on something they're not clear in that process rather than go through the whole thing, because otherwise it will take us about an hour. Okay, but just to say that it hasn't improved, has it? Um, Death and custody. Has it changed? No. Well, it hasn't improved. It hasn't even changed. <laughs> on the legal system, then, then there needs to be no improvement on the legal system. We have a law for murder and it needs to be implemented. We don't need to improve anything in terms of the legal system. It's just not working. So the issue is how do you generate the political will to force the government to ensure that the judiciary do their job properly? That's the issue. It's about political will, and that's what's missing. That's what's missing. If you speak to people like Leslie Thomas, uh, all the top people, uh, you saw Leslie, a lot of you may not know that Leslie Thomas has been made professor at, I can't remember which university it is. He's one of the leading barristers, QCs. And you may have recognized him in the Ibrahim case. He was the guy that came out as a very junior barrister. He's been working on this for over 30 years. And his position is very clear that it's only a question of political will. And that's somebody that's working within the judicial system on this issue. So I think um, calls for changing to the judicial system, calls for improvements in the inquest, 
for me personally, are a complete and utter distraction and waste of time. We have a law of murder. It just needs to be implemented. It's as simple as that. And I think that's where certainly a lot of the older families that you saw in the film, um, that's what they want. They want those cases to be, uh, to go back to court and to be tried properly under a jury like anybody else. Yeah, and just to clarify, so there's not been one prosecution, has there? There have been prosecutions. There's been around 10. There was Joy Gardner, um, Harry, there was quite a few, but they've never been successfully prosecuted. The problem you saw in the film was that the inquest system is a complete, was quite, was quite effective. We had a lot of unlawful killing verdicts over a whole period of time. And when most people hear the verdict unlawful killing, the assumption in the public is that there's going to be some result, that somebody is going to go to jail. Surely unlawful killing means somebody was killed unlawfully. So when people hear that, they assume that the system is working. But of course, unlawful killing means nothing. It's not a sentence. It's not a criminal, you know, it's not part of the criminal um, system. So that's the distraction. And that's why people, uh, the families have been forced into the English system, which is a very archaic British English um, sticky plaster over a gaping wound. That's what, that's what I think anyway. I think there are some laws that are, um, are different in Scotland, but I'm not sure exactly what they are. So, and you know, and, and I, I know they want to set up uh, something like injustice in Scotland as well, that hasn't happened yet. So, but at the, at, at the end of the day, the outcome is still the same. It's still, like you said, at the end of the day, it's still political will that needs to enforce what is so clear of what happens. I mean, it's so clear that, for example, with the um, George Floyd case, you know, the fact that people couldn't believe that the policeman wasn't arrested immediately, people couldn't believe it because they'd seen him kill him. I mean, it's a, it's a similar kind of thing. When you've seen somebody kill somebody else, you arrest them, whether they're a policeman or not. There shouldn't be any question about it. You know, so those are the kind of things, as Ken says, the things, things are already there in place. So it's the political will to enforce them. Nobody is, like I said, nobody's above the law and what, uh, whatever applies to anybody else in terms of wrongdoing applies to the police as well. Super implemented, sorry. So Abby, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? <coughs> that was a, a very powerful and uh, upsetting film to watch. Uh, I have a question for the director. What do you think about the current uh, wave of Black, Ma Black Lives Matter protests? And will this, uh, and do you think it will propel the, the cases again into the limelight? And, how can, and what can we do to help? Abu, that's, that's three questions. You can answer them all, Ken. I'll try to remember them. Um, sorry, Abu, I, I forgot them already. What was the first one? Let's take it one at a time. BLM. Black Lives. Uh, oh, BLM. <laughs> My thoughts on BLM. Um, we uh, we have a good relationship with BLM. Um, uh, four or five years ago, some of the families went over to meet Patrice Colors, who started BLM in the States. Um, BLM UK. BLM is a very complicated organization. It, it, it has many different areas and, and different factions, in fact, and they all want to do different things. Um, BLM in the UK. That, that some of the groups are very sensitive to the fact that the, the, um, uh, Britain is not America. Some of the things that happen here can't be solved with American solutions. And so the fact that um, uh, race being an issue here in terms of this disproportionate number of black people that are killed in custody, a lot of white people are killed as well. So UFFC represents both black and white families. And BLM accepted that when we told them, you know, this is what we are about. So I think that's very important that, pe that they see the, the, the UK context and they respond to it. Going into the streets, being around 20 to 30,000, mostly young people, actually mostly um, a very mixed crowd, um, you know, ethnically, um, whatever that means, uh, was really, really heartening. Uh, they had all the names, they got onto the internet, they found out all the names, they've watched the films, they've done their own research. And I think um, the beauty of what's happening now in terms of a, a grassroots movement, which is not being controlled by um, 
you know some of the the usual players in this area is that um people are waking up they're educating themselves they're educating others and that's very very positive the issue though is that um you can see the state's response straight away is to either attack BLM uh, through through the media organizations or to offer um, very kind of menial um, you know solutions they start talking about um, decolonizing the curriculum that's very good we need to do that they start they talk about uh, supporting uh, black businesses that's very good we have to do that there's lots and lots of things being suggested the one thing that people aren't talking about is jailing the officers that's the one thing that you don't hear a lot of. And I don't know if anyone on here has heard that, that discussion at a national level, a discussion about who are these officers and why are they still working? Um, and the point that we made, and Khadija was there in terms of, you know, that there's this slogan of uh, say, say, that, say, the, say his name, say his name, yeah? That's very, very good. We have to make sure for the collective memory of the struggle, in respect of those people that have been murdered, killed, we have to say their name. But if we don't say the names of the police officers that killed them, then we're not being effective. We, if we don't name those police officers and we don't show those police officers, then it becomes a memorial rather than a movement. And so that's, that's what I would say. And so that's what the film does. It says the names of the police officers and it shows the police officers, which is why the police try to, to stop the film. So Ken, you're one of very few people who do actually name the police officers. Yeah. Who've murdered these people. Um, and I wondered, are your films, in particular, not, not necessarily Injustice, but certainly the, the film with Sean Riggs' case, um, where you showed the evidence from the police. Yeah. Company, are they permissible as evidence in a court of law? No, they're not. Uh, I doubt. Well, no, I wouldn't. Well. They're full of evidence, but it's not evidence in a court. I mean, a film is not a, a film. Is a, the police would argue that film, the film put them on trial. Um, and I would say, yes, it did. It put you on trial because you never went on trial. Uh, the police tried to stop the film being shown because they, they said it was libelous because they hadn't been convicted. The whole point about the film is that they haven't been tried. So how can they be convicted? So their argument you know, didn't stand up. And the argument we put across to them and to the media when the film came out, which is what, yes, the law of libel is important, but it's not as important as the, the right to life. The right to life is more important than the law of libel. So we obviously had that moral argument and that really beat the legal argument. And ultimately, after the, the police tried to stop the film being shown um, using lots of very, you know, very brutal um, intimidatory methods, we told them that we would take them to court. We showed, we took the, the film you've just seen, we took it to um, uh, the police solicitors. I can't remember their name at the moment. They deal with all the police cases. Anyway, one of those, uh, and all the police officers, uh, Tuffy, Harrison, uh, all those officers you just saw were all in a room. Uh, and we showed them the film. Um, I stood behind them in a big, big room. There was, I think it was about 50 police officers in there and all their solicitors. And as they watched the film, I could see their, their, the back of their heads and their ears going different shades of pink and red. Um, it was a funny scene. And then afterwards, uh, we just stood up and we said, OK, if you don't stop harassing the cinemas and threatening the cinemas, we're going to take you to court for loss of earnings because they were stopping the film getting shown. And when after we made that statement, we were never ever bothered again by the police. They completely and utterly backed down, which indicated to us that they had something to hide. Because if you're accused of murder, publicly, a film is put out there and it's shown all over the world and people are watching it. If you are not responsible for that crime, you would sue the filmmaker. It happens all the time. So they haven't gone for us, they haven't sued us. So it's not about evidence in terms of the film, it's about film as a political weapon, as a tool for the families. Yeah, okay. Can you say something about the distribution of the film, the censorship from, well, state and private media? Um, that we're at very different times today. Look at what we do now. Everyone is like in their house, we're on social media. In 2001, there was no social media. 
you know there was nothing it was absolutely nothing you had to do stuff and the only way you could get it out there was through word of mouth um so what we did um is you know we have a history of political activism when we were making injustice um and we discovered there had been over a thousand deaths the first thing that shocked us was that not one single newspaper not one single television station had ever bothered to count the number of people killed in police custody and we thought that was astounding all the journalists had never ever done that and when we had that just that one fact a thousand people between those those years that's that was what i think shocked people initially uh, and then you can see in the film that the emotion in the film and the facts of the film and the, the evidence in the film because the film journalistically and evidentially is very strong you know you you see it as well as the emotion uh, they just couldn't handle it and i think um what we thought was okay how are we going to um, make this uh, have an impact so we decided to call um, deaths in police custody uh, we decided not to use that phrase anymore we decided to use the phrase human rights abuses yeah at that time the human rights act in britain and the fact that somebody had actually used the word human rights abuses against serving british police officers was very very um confrontational as far as the state was concerned so we decided to because uh, it wasn't supported by anybody it was funded by um you know different groups of people and not crowdfunding because we had no crowdfunding then um it took seven years to make we lived on pot noodles for seven years that was um, that wasn't very good for us but we've survived if i stood up now you'll see my belly has, has weathered the storm uh anyway we got it done and we decided to have a screening in central London. Uh, we, we decided to invite all the countries that Britain accused of human rights abuses. Uh, and we had the ambassadors from China, Iran, Pakistan, Libya, Cuba, uh, lots of countries coming to see the film because they were shocked that this was going on. Nobody knew this was going on. It's hard to imagine today when you all know this, living in a country where this was not known. It's, it's just astounding that 20 years later, we're in this position. Anyway, uh, the police heard about the film. Um, we helped them to hear about it in different ways. And uh, they decided to sue the cinema and the cinema pulled the film. And then we spent around three months running up and down the country. Um, uh, um, despite the fact there wasn't social media, what we discovered after working in complete isolation, not knowing really what we were doing, not really knowing what would happen with the film, but just going on and on and on with the families. Um, when the film went out there, there was this huge upsurge of people wanting to show the film. This huge upsurge of ordinary people across from all different communities saying, we want to know and we want to help. And what happened was that every time a cinema pulled the film and we had it, it was supposed to go in Glasgow pulled, Manchester pulled, Birmingham pulled, uh, lots and lots of screenings, 20 or 30 screenings. Somebody would get up in the cinema once the letter came in from the police and they would say, okay, I work in a school, I run a pub, we're in this squat, blah, blah, whatever it was. And the whole audience was literally walk down the road and, and watch the film that same evening. And the police realized they wouldn't be able to kill it. Uh, and eventually we had secret screenings. We, had, we used to have to meet people outside a tube station in London, take them to a secret location to watch the film. It was just completely insane. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about the story. But, you know, it's, it's just the film at the end of the day. And what happened to the film is not as important as what happened to the family. Mm. Yeah, and could you just... What, so I'm having, I've got a lot of private messages saying, what can we do? How long does it take to get justice? And the family, what support? How long is a piece of, piece of string? How long is a piece of string? I mean, we've waited for five years, which is long enough. Other families have waited more than twice that amount of time. Um, we have a change.org petition. Um, and even though the public inquiry has been announced, it's still important to add your name to that to show that the public want, want answers and the public are behind us and the public believe, not just as well behind us, but they're behind this whole situation. So it's really, really important that people still sign the change.org. There's also a crowdfunder. 
Um, if, if people can donate to that, anything from a, you know, a minimum of five pounds is absolutely great. It all really helps. So I think we've got our, our, um, our links up on your site. I can read them out if it's, if it's uh, helpful. Yeah, they're, they're going out now. You know, um, and just as well, if people can come to, I think there are, there are marches in Scotland. Um, for our case and for other people's cases, we have a march on the 30th of October from Trafalgar Square in London. If anybody can either, even if they can't make it there, if they've got family there, friends there, please encourage them to come down on the march. Um, yes, it's, some, it's uh, Saturday, Saturday the 30th of October at midday at Trafalgar Square. And please find out and support the ones in Scotland as well, because it's happening to more families in Scotland. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to set up an injustice. Um, uh, organization. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to set up like a UFFC in Scotland. We shouldn't actually, UFFC shouldn't even really exist. It shouldn't have to exist. Mm. But it does. So please, please support the families. They need it continuously because you can just imagine when the anniversary of your death of a loved one comes up and you still don't know how they died or if, the, if your body of your loved one is still um, held on to by the state, which can happen for a very long time. It really, really hurts. You, I mean, you really can't really bury your loved one properly. Or even when you, when you do, you've got police surrounding you because they think that you're going to do something. It, it's crazy. Yeah, so please, please support the families in that way. Write to your MP as well. Writing to MPs all, always helps. Yeah, says, well, so that's the annual UFFC March. Ken, when did it start? Um, it started yeah. when we were making the film. Um, what? Just very briefly. Um, in London, where we were based, uh, there were all these deaths happening and um, families were being supported by um, small political groups who had different, um, uh, different um, ideas of what the solution was. Uh, and we realized that there was no uh, campaign which actually gave the power to the families and united the families. And so whilst we made the film, um, which I said was made over seven years. Um, and I think somebody spoke about how articulate the families were and how, how strongly they came across. Um, and that was partly because we decided not to interview them until um, five years after we started making the film. Uh, because by then they'd been through the whole process. I mean, we filmed them outside the court and in protests and this kind of thing, but we didn't do a sit down interview with them because we knew that um, with the, um, with reflection of time, they could have more power and impact than, than any solicitor, than any journalist, than any expert. And so they became the experts, experts that could articulate the legal process, could articulate the emotional process, and could articulate the political process. And when a family member does that, there isn't one single person in the country that can speak against them, from the prime minister to, to the, everybody is completely shamed. And I've seen that happening. I've seen the Attorney General silenced by Myrna, by Myrna Simpson. I've seen police officers, I've seen all these people with so-called power absolutely silenced and embarrassed and ashamed when they're confronted with the families. And I think that's the power of the families and obviously that's the power of this film because it forces everybody to really question some ideas they have about um, the legal issues, but also in terms of race. I mean, I've shown this film to all white audiences and for a lot of people, uh, this is the first time they've actually listened to black people speaking yeah, about something that they care about. And I, I know it sounds strange to say because we live in a multicultural society and people inter, interrelate, and, but to actually listen to somebody uh, talking in the, in, the, in the way that the people speak in the film really uh, moved people and, and changed people. And I think that's, you know, that's the power of of art to change people's attitudes, whether it's film or, or, or writing or, or anything, you know? Um, sorry, I always go off on a bloody tangent. I don't even know what you asked me now. <laughs> okay. um, so just, I'm going to read out some comments. So yeah. Adam says, I feel if officers are charged, then that would be, then they would be less crucial. So I think there's sort of argument for reformation and abolition, isn't there? Abby, do you want to talk on that, or Ken? <coughs> it's, an absolute, it's an absolute travesty. They're just, uh, they're just uh, uh, supporting each other to get away with these yeah. crimes. 
Yeah. It's just set up in a way. It's set up in a way that they're just uh, covering each other's backs, mm. and also uh, with this uh, racism inquiry, they got somebody in charge who doesn't even believe in institutional racism. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, and that was all organised, right. obviously. It's worth you two talking about the IPCC. So Janet said something. If the independent police complaint comes under the Home Secretary, how can things change? And maybe talk about the. Um, I, I I think you should, yeah. Ken, can you say something about the IPCC? Um, you saw in the film um, the the PCA was. Uh, the, the Police Complaints Authority was the body that, that investigated police in the 90s. Uh, the impact of the film, one of the political impacts of the film was uh, it forced the abolishment of the PCA and the, um, the, uh, uh, what's the, uh, the IPCC was created. Um, it, was, it was a huge success for the families at that time and people don't really understand the, the power and the importance of that move. Of course, two, three, four years down the line, uh, the IPCC uh, reverted to, to type and began behaving in the same way that the PCA did. Uh, and then because of that, there was pressure and then it was changed to the IOPCC. Uh, these are all letters and I get them mixed up sometimes, not because I'm dyslexic or, or getting senile, it's because they just have no absolute, they have no meaning, they're just letters. Uh, the body is funded by the state, it's run by the state, it, it, even the email address is .gov.uk, I mean, what does that tell you? So I think these bodies are, are just c complete distractions. Um, it, it's not even worth abolishing them, because whatever you put in this place will do the same thing again. Uh, the only reason they're there is because criminal charges are not being pushed hard enough. They're only there because the political will is not there within the government of the time, whether it's Labour or whether it's Conservative. It's all the same. There is no political will. And the only way you change political will is by a mass movement. You saw it with the Me Too movement. You've seen it historically with Vietnam, with the anti-war movement. This is the power of the people, and this is what has to happen. I won't be distracted in arguing about the IPCC and the PCA. That's not my job. It's the government's job. It's not our job. Our job as people is to make sure that um, as many people know as what's going on as possible. And what I would say just, just very broadly is that if you think about cases like the Mangrove uh, uh, no. and the Bradford 12 from the 80s and 70s, those people stood in court and they fought for their communities. In, in, in the 70s, if you call the police officer a liar in court, you would be thrown into jail. There was no concept that the police officers could lie because of cases like the Mangrove 12, uh, Bradford, uh, sorry, Bradford 12, Mangrove 9 and New and 7. These are all, you know, cases where people fought against the state and won. The majority of people in this country now know police, police officers are capable of, of lying, of sexual assault, of stealing, of racism because of the Stephen Lawrence case. And that's happened over the past 40 years. Now, the final thing is around police violence. And this is what we're seeing today. This is what we're seeing happening. The majority of people being aware that police violence is there and it has to be dealt with. So I'm quite hopeful, providing um, the pressure is kept up, providing the, the, uh, the state and all the organizations that will sit down at a table with the state and negotiate, yeah, if those people, are allowed to control the direction of what's happening, then we've lost. I don't think there should be any negotiation with government. I think the pressure should be kept up. I think the mass of the people should keep going onto the streets. And I think people should be talking about this in their workplaces and to their friends and making this a public debate so that, that there's, a, a, there's a, a growth of the movement and we keep it going. I'm confident that um, there will be uh, successful prosecutions in this country. I just don't know when. But for me, it's a question of the sooner the better, obviously. Um, we all feel like that. Um, but there, there have been opportunities. Channel 4 could have shown this film. And I, I'm sure it would have sparked a debate 20 years ago that we're having now. There's no doubt about it. Imagine if the whole country had watched the film of how you felt after watching it tonight. They, they, they couldn't have controlled it. And of course, they were wise not to. I understand what Channel 4 did. I understand why they didn't show it. Um, it's the, that's their role. Big speech over. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add to that. I just wanted to add to that because that's so good. Um, the uh, I think the equivalent of IPCC 
in Scotland is called Perk, just so that um, people realise that's that's that again that have a slight difference. But it's, it's basically it's the same role, but they've got that different name. But I couldn't add anything to else, obviously, to what what Ken has said. Yeah. Well, hopefully okay. they'll they'll show the next film. Yeah, Ken, when's the release date? Um, October. Yeah. Yeah, but in the meantime, I've put a couple of links, um, uh, you, you know, to uh, for change.org. Please don't give them any money. You don't need to. Just sign the petition. I don't know why they're asking people for money. It's just ridiculous. Um, but as Khadija said, if you have money, there's the Sheku campaign, and also if people want to support the, the making of the, this film, well, it's, it's made already. We just need some money to finish it off. That would be really helpful. Um, and the links are on the chat. Um, There's a couple of questions. So Emma's asking about alternative news, news sources, which Ken and Kadisha recommend to follow these cases from a less mainstream, state condoned and white perspective. That's a lovely question. Um, I, I don't know if the, what the alternative ones are, are, Ken, but I think what we tend to do is the ones that are reporting properly, we do put them up on like the UFFC uh, website, the ones that are, are, are usually quite good. So please check on that, on, on, on that site, UFFC. It's basically United, no, it's actually UFFC and then it's campaign, but the last C is also the C for the campaign, dot org. Yes. And there's also uh, an Instagram account. I've already discovered Instagram. My son told me how to use it about a week ago. And now I can't get off it just because mm -hmm. of the novelty. Um, but it's great because you can, you know, you can be in touch with hundreds and thousands of people. Um, and I think that there's, yeah, that we do work with lots of organizations. Uh, it's got to the point now where, you know, Bloomberg TV and CNN and, uh, you know, Sky are talking to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Because yeah. um, from my position, whilst I consider myself to be a radical filmmaker, I don't want to be an alternative. I want to be the voice of the people instead of the BBC. I won't allow the states to control media, and we shouldn't allow the state to control media. So, I, you know, I'm an I'm alternative filmmaker. But, you know, I don't want to be underground. I want to be... Um, you know, pushing the state and the mainstream media to do their job properly, so then I can fucking retire from this pain. There is one I'm going to recommend, actually, and all like uh, not so much an alternative, but one that is is quite good. I I feel they they tell the stories, but they also give the news. Novara Media. They've got some mm -hmm. good journalists on there, and journalists yeah. who you know written for mainstream, but sometimes they're even fed up themselves with the mainstream. N o v a r a Novara Media. I would recommend those two. You can usually find them on on like on YouTube or something. Yeah, so they're, they're, good they're, they're uh -huh, so they support BLM and they're very much the founders have come from sort of the student protest street movement. Yeah, it's not just so much that they support us; they they write balanced from a balanced viewpoint, you know, mm -hmm. and they will have they will dig behind what you might see on the on the mainstream media to write the story that you may not see. Yeah, and Tipper's website, which is Forward River UK, um, yeah. also gathers lots of resources. Yeah, that's a good point, um, Sadie, because um, T Tipper is uh, is the cousin of Mikey Powell, um, who was um, who was I would say murdered by the police in Birmingham, um, and uh, he set up the Forward Ever campaign, and also very importantly, um, we set up together Migrant Media, UFFC, and um, Forward Ever set up the um, National Memorial and um, Family Fund, which, and I think some of the people who you've been working with have been working on some stuff, which is going to be uh, donating money to the fund. Um, because what's happened recently, um, that fund has beginning to, ha has now gone into operation and it's going to be directly giving money to family campaigns. Families can get direct um, support because there's nothing like that in the country. A family can't get support, it, whether it's it wants to make a banner, whether it needs money to travel to see a politician in London, whether it need, they need some counselling or the kids maybe need to go out for the day. It's really, really basic stuff. Not the big campaigning, not the big 
news thing, not the big support structures, just simple things. And I think that's the kind of thing that really needs to be supported. And I'm really pleased that it started. It's going to make its first um, uh, funding round to family families uh, in July. Uh, and if you can, um, because I think with that one, um, Tipper likes people to like donate. I think you can donate five pounds a month or something like that. So it's long term. They can plan into the future. It's not just about today, and it's not just about tomorrow. It's about you know the next five, ten years. Um, unfortunately, I said that twenty five years ago. So. <laughs> right. um, and on that on that point, so um, Laurie, who's our designer and part of the Time Span Gang, has designed our heritage manifesto. Mm a beautiful design and we're um, pushing that into titles and posters and 100% profits are going for towards the UFFC family campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please buy Thank a tea towel. Yeah. We really appreciate these things. They really make a difference. Absolutely. Yes. Thank Absolutely. You. It's important to be acting. I mean, it's one thing talking about things, which I think our institutions are very good at, but I think um, it's very important for us to, you know, get our hands dirty in that. Are there any other questions? Jackie, as always. Jackie, are you happy to come on mic and talk about the history of the clearances? So Jackie's bringing sort of police violence and sort of asymmetric power structures back to the local history of the Highland clearances. Sorry, Sadie, just to let you know, I have to go in a minute. Um, okay, right. So, Jackie, before you come on, does anyone... Hello, Michelle. Yeah, you, you have the last word. You tell us what you want. Me? Yeah, you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, you've heard me before, support. Support. I mean, I think people can see over the past few years, the power around the country when we all come together, when we all come together and fight together, uniting and fighting for the same thing is absolutely key. So please not only support the Sheku Bio, um, Justice for Sheku Bio campaign, support UFFC. Um, find out, just find out, inform yourself of what is going on in the other campaigns. If it all feels overwhelming, select one family to support. They would appreciate it. Absolutely. Adita, thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm in the same position because I was supposed to be on another call at half past eight. Okay, so everyone actually, you can, if there's follow up questions, then you can email me and then I'm happy to. Yeah. Um, yep, yeah, happy to respond. Absolutely. And also support Ken's film too, because we need, we need to see that film. So there's a crowdfunder for that. If that's what you're interested in, please support that because it helps us all. Yeah, and please sign up for next week's book club, which will be run by Stella Dadsey, and it's about the heart of the reef. Oh, I'm oh, I'm checking into that. Thank you. Yeah, you yeah, said yeah. the details. Can I, can I just, amazing. Um, can I thank Time Span and Sadie and Ian and everybody else and all of you for coming tonight and um, not getting a bit distracted by song on Sunday or whatever is on television at the moment. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's been good. Ben, it was Ken and Khadija and Ian yeah. behind the scenes. Hi, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Khadija. Thank you, Tans. Um, absolutely amazing, amazing job. Really, 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 really informative, really powerful filmmaking, really powerful stories. And I've written everything down, Ken, about uh say the names of the police officers it's not enough just to say the name it is enough but it's not it needs more yeah to say the names of the family members so definitely something to take forward there'll, there'll, uh, be more, there'll be more names coming out in october for some of the other cases so let's wait and see what they do yeah. okay good night everybody good night everyone thank, thank, you. thank you thank you thank you I think yeah. I'm going to